Well, hello everybody. My name is Philip Roscoe um, and this is just a little presentation that I gave to colleagues and I'm now recording because I think you might find it interesting on what a sociology of finance can tell us about the USS pensions dispute. This started off as a, a, a short sort of talk or conversation I had with my students to explain why I was taking part in the industrial action and metamorphosed into discussions on the picket line and eventually the seminar that you're about to see. When I say a sociology of finance, I mean a sort of slightly boundarized mashup of social studies of finance, the STS inflected social studies of finance and more mainstream economic sociology. But I think the crucial thing here is that without being partisan, we can use the tools that these disciplines provide to help us think through and understand some of what is a very complicated set of issues. So I start off my standard kind of kicking off place for something like this is to think about how finance looks in economics textbooks. And I say in economics textbooks because I don't mean to academic economists who come in a variety of shapes and sizes and, 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 and perceptions and views of the world. I mean the kind of standard MBA trained uh, um, administrative ideas that circulate in, in, in the world today and that we have to that we have to deal with and response and are responsible in some shape or form for the situation that we're in. So the market, for example, is seen in a relatively generic place. Economics doesn't have a lot of time for the market per se. It tends to focus instead on the uh, preferences and actions of agents. So the market fades into the background. It's simply where a crowd of knowledgeable buyers meets a crowd of knowledgeable sellers. Similarly, prices. These are neutral representations of supply and demand, computations of the knowledge that these knowledgeable buyers and knowledgeable sellers have between them. Financial markets, markets generally are perceived to be generally benign allocative devices where their virtues include efficiency and do commerce and all of these kind of things. And finance is separate from 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 culture. It's kind of culturally uh, apart, just as it is abstracted from history, geography and politics. There's a kind of assumption that that market agents and, and, and all of these things transcend such minutiae as, as culture geography and politics. From a sociological perspective, however, this clearly isn't the case. So here are some crucial sociological observations that can help us think through some of these issues. The first is to do with that place where the buyers meet the sellers. Well, this matters. The social, material and technological apparatus of the market has effects. The second point is that prices and other financial facts are made. This comes straight out of science and technology studies and the understanding of the laborious construction of, of scientific facts. And they too have careers, as Latour has pointed out, at some point, because we couldn't do science if we had to reinvent the world over and over again from, from, you know, from the very beginning, reinvent the whole of science. Facts break loose of the circumstances of their production, they become naturalised and they circulate in the world. From Michel Callon, particularly in 1998, we draw the, the important inference that networks of calculations reproduce and, and contain power relations. So if we think about the, you know, the kind of uh, um, uh, unbalance of, uh, of power that we might have when we stand in the supermarket as a single shopper against all these kind of databases and shelves and packaging and things that they know, or when we go on to Amazon and what the, you know, the, the, the knowledge that the site have built up over the years, not just us but of all shoppers and and how this can be displayed by particular algorithms and so forth we are in a position of of weakness as consumers here and these are embedded in networks of calculation which themselves are transmitted through social and technological agencies an inference from more standard uh, American economic sociology is that power struggles congeal in market prices. This is from Krippner. And finally, the observation that financial markets and finance generally have political, historical and geographical settings. 
Notably, and of crucial re relevance here, the current ascendance of financial economics as a current te as a technology of government and the growth of financialization, by which I mean, I know this is a kind of uh, slippery word, but I mean three things here, a reliance on financial market based mechanisms for the provision of social goods, an opening up of individuals as sites of profit for financial markets and a concomitant transfer of risk to the individuals. And we will see all of these kind of things going on in our discussion of the uh, of the deficit. And what I what I want to say, I think, is that that somewhere between these two conceptions, the one, the sort of, you know, dispassionate economics, real economic realist conception of a financial fact and the messy sociological actuality and practice of of the construction of these financial facts or prices in between that that those two uh, settings there is a gap and in that gap things happen and things can be done and we need to start trying to take these seriously um, and unpack what's going on So a little bit of background here about the history and characteristics of USS, which for those who don't know is the University Superannuation Scheme, the UK's academic pension uh, pension scheme established in 1975 to deal with poor retirement outcomes for academics. Now, it was set up as an open ended final salary scheme, which means two things. It means, firstly, that members accrued a guaranteed payment of a proportion of their final salary for every year served. This is a defined benefit scheme. And secondly, as it is open ended, it is funded both by investment returns on existing contributions and by future contributions. This is how states work, for example. You know, they, not everything in a state is paid for up front. Some things are paid for by or uh, anticipated to be paid for by future contributions. But things have changed since uh, over the last 10 years or so. In 2011, the final salary scheme was closed to new members. Uh, in 2016, this was closed to existing members. Accrual levels, that's the amount that you, you save up for every year of service have been reduced and capped. In 2018, um, the proposed closure of the defined benefit scheme was overturned by industrial action. Um, but again, in 2022, accrual levels have been reduced and capped. And yet at the same time, contributions made both by employers and by employees, that's us, have steadily increased. And these have been quite quite material. I think it's reasonable to say that that over the period that I've been in the scheme since 2009, um, all other things being equal, if I if I stay in my present job, if I uh, work to retirement, then my reasonable expectation of pension has more or less halved over that time. So that's very, very significant. The fund is governed in a particular way. There's the executive, which is led by Chief Executive Officer Bill Galvin. There's a board of trustees with mixed appointments chaired by Dame Janet Baker. And then any changes or reforms um, need to be signed off by the Joint Negotiating Committee, the JNC, which is made up by five UUK members, five UCU members. So that's five members of, uh, appointed by the employers, UUK being the uh, umbrella body for the universities, five uh, members as appointed by uh, the union, that's uh, UCU, and an impartial chair. The impartial chair being a grandee from practice, Sir Andrew Kuby, until he retired at the age of 73 in 2020, and now uh, Judith Fish. But also the pensions regulator is closely involved with governments, especially assessing the covenant and discount rates. Mentioning the covenant, it's worth saying that the, the point about this scheme is that it is a shared scheme across all UK higher education institutions, apart from the so-called 1992 universities. Um, so there's, you know, I don't know how, how many, 100 or so members, um, and there's a collective sharing and risk and responsibility across these. And this is tied up in the covenant, which we shall come to later. And our industrial action in 2018 led to the uh, formation of the Joint Evaluative Panel, the JEP, and various recommendations, some of which were acted upon and others were not. So, putting all this in a graphical form, 
who are the actors in this drama? Well, to start with uh, the USS executives and trustees, they're there. They talk to the actuary and the advisors who talk back to them. There's the pensions regulator who talks to USS executives, but I don't get the impression they kind of talk back or push back in any meaningful way. And we'll see why that might be in a few minutes. Then there's us, the scheme members. Now I've drawn a sort of dotted line there because we are consulted. We are asked our opinion about stuff, but we don't have, you know, kind of a meaningful engagement with USS uh, executives and trustees. We do, however, have our union, um, which talks uh, both to the employers in a slightly adversarial way, the universities, um, and has its seats on the on the joint negotiating committee, the JNC. Then, of course, there are the universities represented by UUK who talk regularly to the USS executives and trustees. And all of this goes into the valuation tools. Um, and, and, and this is where the action happens. You know, the, the decisions that are made around how the valuation is going to be done. And then at the end of it all, out pops the valuation, which sits in place for a little while until another one is, is done. So the key points is that the power relations around these particular group of, of, of actors coalesce into the valuation via the valuation tools. These are the site of contest. Um, as, as, as Greta Krippner writes memorably, congealed into every market exchange is a history of struggle and contestation that has produced actors with certain understandings of themselves and the world that predispose them to exchange under a certain set of social rules and not another. In this sense, the state, culture and politics are contained in every market act, which I think is very nicely put. So how do we value pension funds? That's the next question. And for this kind of STS inflected uh, uh, um, uh, investigation, one has to dive into the nitty gritty, at least as much as, uh, as, as I can understand it. So the UK legislation, the Pensions Act of 2004, requires a formal valuation to be conducted at least every three years. Um, and the expectation is that the valuation will be completed within 15 months. And I think there's a bit of kind of preamble on the front and negotiation and so forth. In other words, you know, a, a pension funds exist in a more or less continuous state of ongoing valuation. And this is what the trustees do. They they don't actively manage our investments. They they subcontract that to other investment managers. Of course, they have a handle on the whole portfolio and where it's going. And we'll come to that in a minute as well. But but a lot of what they actually do is 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 value the fund and legislation requires say uh, a, a, a professional service firm Deloitte legislation requires that the value of the scheme assets be taken at market value and the assessed value of the schemes liabilities the technical provisions must be measured on a prudent basis Deborah Mabbott, the economist, writing in USS Briefs, um, says that uh, financialization, which is an often vague term, has a well-defined meaning in the context of pensions with distinct and traceable consequences. Valuation uses three financial techniques, discounting, mark-to-market pricing, and a measuring of risk by volatility. Discounting is used to turn the future flow of pension payments into a present value for liabilities. Assets are valued at their current market prices and the risk that assets will be insufficient to meet liabilities in the future is estimated from the past volatility of asset prices. In other words, present assets at market value, we all know what that is, and, and regulators like present assets at market value because it gets rid of nasty things like, uh, you know, kind of assumption and judgment and all of these kind of things. In other words, it stops investment bankers telling fibs if we just take the price that the market gives us. So present assets at market value minus future liabilities discounted by forecast investment returns. These are the technical provisions. So, I'm going to unpack these in a little more detail uh, uh, as we go along. But the, the crucial thing is that this is a very particular method of understanding how a fund should be should be valued. It comes out of the mindset of financial economics um, and it sees 
a, a snapshot of the of the assets and a snapshot of the liabilities in the future, cumulative liabilities in the future, which are discounted, reduced by the amount that we expect to earn on, on our investments year on year. And this should, because we understand risk, and this again is a, is something that comes straight out of financial economics, this should be more than zero, it should be in surplus more than half of the time. And I say 67% because USS uh, uses or has previously used 67%, two thirds of the time as its kind of, you know, uh, safety rod for um, for understanding risk. So risk is in, is understood in terms of volatility. There is another way, another possible way of valuing this kind of fund, and that would be an accounting method. That would be a cash flow budgeting method that would take future payments and so forth on an ongoing basis as a going concern into account. But that is not one that is being invoked here. So let's dig a little bit more into these technical provisions. These comprise, and I've put, Everything that is judgment in purple on this slide, that's why about half the slide is, is purple. These comprise the amount to be paid in the future, which is affected by existing pension holders, their life expectancy and the forecast inflation. Current employees, their number, their persistence in their scheme, their life expectancy and inflation. Lots of purple here. And then a discount equivalent to forecast investment returns, which are which is which are affected by economic outlook and expected performance, asset mix, the things broadly speaking a pension fund can invest in are infrastructure, equities and bonds, particularly gilts, risk profile and volatility, which is itself dependent upon the employer covenant, which is currently tending to strong and some prudence here, which is a kind of bit of a gray area. You know, um, uh, it, it, it's uh, it's just a little bit of wiggle room for, for, for unhappy events that the trustees add in. And as a shorthand, funds use a gilts plus method. Now, gilts are government bonds. Now, Gilts, these are government bonds, are perceived as being the safest investment that money can buy. US Treasury bonds, 30 year T bills or whatever, absolutely the safest thing you could possibly put, put, you, put, put your money in, in terms of investments. But the problem is that since 2014, since governments have been pursuing uh, uh, QE, quantitative evening, easing, they have done so by buying bonds. And that has driven the price of bonds up and, and in doing so has lowered the return. So you can imagine if you had uh, a bond that was issued at £100 for easy money and it was paying a 2% coupon, it would pay you 2% a year and eventually you would get your £100 back. But if you had to buy it in the market for £110, then that 2% return, that £2 return, which you would still get, has been re reduced by approximately 10%. And so it goes. So the price and the return on bonds uh, are inversely affect one another. So you can see there in that graph the, the, the decline in returns on these uh, risk-free sta stable assets to a point where it is now costly for, um, for uh, uh, trustees of pension funds to, to own gilts. They return less than inf inflation. They have a negative yield. So clearly, the more you of, of these kind of financial instruments you have in your portfolio, the more the more the bigger your portfolio is going to need to be. And USS writes since the 31st of March 2018, they wrote this last year, I think long term yields on gilts have fallen significantly. A lower outlook for future investment returns means we need to hold more assets in the scheme now in order to provide for the pension promises we need to pay members in the future. As a result, providing defined benefit pensions has continued to become more expensive since the last valuation. This is one of their documents talking about the, the differences between the, the 2018 and the 2020 valuation. So, and it's important to add to that 
that this represents a very particular way of viewing risk, which has been drawn directly from financial econometrics, which is that one infers the vol risk is seen as volatility. It is the seen as the chance on any given day of there being a swing in the value of assets underlying the portfolio. So it is inferred, you know, the kind of wiggly, wiggly, wiggly line of stock charts or whatever. From historical volatility, we infer or imply future volatility. And this is how we work out the risk in a portfolio. And on that basis, we can run statistical analysis that give us these kind of certainty levels of a particular percent of a time. That's where our 67 percent of the time comes from. Now, the problem of risk is intimately tied to the role of the UK's pensions regulator, TPR. Pensions regulator obviously is a government organisation and it looks after the pensions protection fund, the so-called pensions lifeboat, which was where if a pension fund goes bust, you know, as in the case of uh, the employees of uh, BHS or Carillion or what have you, they all end up in the pension protection fund. They get paid out of proportion, I think 80 percent of their of their accrued pensions. And this is funded by uh, by effectively by the UK taxpayer in a slightly roundabout way. So the pensions regulator's sole remit is to stop funds from falling into this pensions lifeboat, particularly USS because USS is huge and USS would potentially, if it ran out of money, bust the pension fund, although it would bust the pensions lifeboat. But, uh, you know, the, the, it does, the USS is different from uh, um, Carillion or BHS in that it has a lot of assets behind it. But nonetheless, this is the concern of the regulator. So the regulator then insists upon ultra, ultra prudent valuation method, measures such as a cautious view on the covenants. An evaluation is also based on ultra conservative assumption that the funds are effectively closed, i.e. that no future employees join. This isn't just the pensions regulator. This is part of this financialized valuation that takes a snapshot of the present assets as set against the future liabilities. So the pensions regulator has uh, this long term emphasis on de-risking, by which it means moving investments to a less volatile investment risk. If one sees uh, if one sees risk in terms of uh, of the possibility of bad outcomes, which is from the implied volatility of the underlying portfolio, then one can reduce the possibility of, uh, of, of, of bad outcomes by de-risking by moving into into bonds but unfortunately this has the very contrary effect of lowering the overall uh, uh, um, discount rate lowering the overall expected investment performance because bonds are costly okay so we're already in a first bit of a vicious circle here in 2013, Bill Galvin moved from his role of the head of the pensions regulator to the chief executive of USS with a remit to impose stability on the scheme. So there's a clear transfer of this particular kind of government thinking. And in 2014, he introduced the now notorious Test One. Um, and uh, this the idea of this was to move the scheme towards self-sufficiency, i.e. it would have enough money if no further members joined to meet all its obligations and, and run itself down. And at this point, it could be sold to an insurance company um, who would run it profitably. And, they were, you know, that would that would be the end of the fund. So that would be a big risk out of the way or big far off, you know, uh, slight possibility, but potential risk out of the way for uh, for the pensions regulator. Test one, I should say, was was removed as the result of the 2018 industrial action. And we'll come back to that. So the other way or another way that the pensions regulator is uh, involved in this valuation is in its assessment of the scheme's covenant, which is also done, you know, between the trustees and the employers. Now, the covenant is effectively a guarantee by the employers that they will collectively mop up anything that's left over in the case of a disaster. Now, the stronger your covenant, the more risk you can have in your portfolio. The more risk you can have in your portfolio, the higher the discount levels that you can employ, the lower your 
forecast future liabilities and the lower the gap between assets and liabilities, the lower your deficit in this case. The pensions fund is very keen that we don't overstate. It's not the pensions fund, sorry. The pensions regulator is very keen that we don't overstate the um, the strength of the covenant. And they have repeatedly insisted that <coughs> the schemes covenant is not strong, but tending to strong. And this is because limitations of cash flows available to service the scheme's contribution requirements. One of the reasons, though, that scheme contribution requirements are very high, they are very high and very expensive for employers, is because the deficit is such that the because of the de-risking of the portfolio, that um, we're having to put a lot of money in to, to, to try and sort this out. Secondly, that there's too much volatility in the scheme's funding due to the level of the risk and the employers can't necessarily support that. So again, they're concerned about the levels of, of, uh, uh, of slightly riskier assets that we hold. And thirdly, that there has been a significant increase in borrowing in the sector, um, which limits the ability of institutions to meet future potential you know, catastrophic uh, losses. Now, uh, it, on that front, I think we have to be sympathetic to the, the pensions regulator because we do know that the institutions are, some of them, very heavily indebted and it will limit their financial resilience uh, in, the, in the future. But the point to take away from all of this is, is, is not so much the nitty gritty, but, but this is all about residual risk in the scheme, where the sort of spectre of catastrophe should go, would go if it were to happen. But that risk is itself the product of the modes of calculation that are being employed, both on a kind of ontological level in that the risk only exists as a result of a financialized valuation but also on a very practical and performative level. The deficit makes contribution levels high, which makes the government weaker, which lowers risk appetite and increases the deficit and so forth. We see these self reinforcing feedback loops at work. So in 2020, when we had persuaded the uh, trustees to abandon this test one of self-sufficiency, USS adopted a different kind of valuation method, a so-called dual valuation method. So it's kind of common practice and accepted wisdom in the pensions industry that as a fund matures, that is, as members stop working and paying in and start retiring and, and drawing out, and as uh, the actuaries have a much clearer idea of the future obligations and liabilities of a fund, then the assets of the fund should naturally shift towards less volatile, less risky investments that would closely match the future obligations of, of the fund. And uh, that was the approach that has been adopted here, or at least in terms of the valuation. I say this because it's not clear what is happening with the actual underlying asset mix. We assume that this is the case, but USS talks about a mixed asset mix and, and so forth. So we don't quite quite know whether the, this is happening. But it doesn't matter. The point is that all of this contestation is taking place in the battleground of the valuation and the valuation tools. So anyway, um, the uh, the the post retirement portfolio is valued at a discount rate of of gilts plus one percent per annum. Don't worry too much about this gilts plus. It's just a kind of shorthand. The point is that this is a extremely low discount rate, which leaves us with a, a large future obligation for those people post retirement. And the key issue for USS is that there are it's a big fund and a substantial proportion of members, maybe a third, I think, maybe even I, I don't know quite off the top of my head. We'll see on the next slide. But a lot of obligations are uh, are post retirement and then in pre retirement the uh, the trustees consulted employees about their views on risk and so forth could they adopt you know uh, two two percent for attending to strong covenant as the pensions regulator would like or potentially three and a half percent or even you know it, um, I think that was the 
that was the maximum. Well, what you can see, though, the, the, the point to, to make is that the, the deficit is incredibly sensitive to small changes in, uh, in discount rate. Because this goes on for a period of years, it's cumulative because the fund is big. All of these things feed into it. So you can see this line at the bottom here that I've drawn around, you know, 2%. It's a deficit of 18 billion at 2.5%, uh, 15 billion. 3%, 12 billion, and I think behind my head is 3.5%, uh, 9 billion, something like that. That's nearly 10 billion pounds worth of difference in forecast deficit for a percentage and a half of the, the, the discount rate. And crucially, uh, uh, Deloitte uh, say again that, that um, as schemes have matured, matured in recent years, the post-retirement discount rate has become a much more material assumption than the pre-retirement discount rate. And for a typical pension scheme, changing the post-retirement discount rate will change the liabilities by three times more than equivalent change to the pre-retirement discount rate. So. What you notice here, though, is that the post-retirement discount rate is fixed. It is never struggled over, even though we have a big contingent of, of uh, retired members drawing, drawing benefits. Um, and, and Deloitte goes so far as to say that, that, that some employers have begun to challenge this assumption um, and to, to not switch their investments into bonds. Instead, um, they say that for many schemes, provided that the employer covenant is sufficiently strong, it is entirely feasible to continue running the scheme with a 40 to 50 percent of the assets invested in growth assets. So that's what the, the professionals are, are, are advising. But there's something else going on here as well. And this is like our kind of first sense of a little bit of smoke and mirrors on the part of USS in that they say 67% uh, confidence level was used for the 2018 valuation. Based on the model used in the present valuation, this would result in pre-retirement discount rates of a gilts four and a half plus four and a half percent or gilts plus three and point four percent um, and a post-retirement discount rate of gilts plus 1.2. However, these rates fall outside the range that we're prepared to accept for the valuation. So they're saying these discount rates, they're too high. We're not prepared to accept them. So in order to, to change the discount rate, we adjust one of the other dials. You get a sense of this as being this kind of big clockwork thing where you can turn one thing or turn another thing, adjust another thing. They raise the required confidence level um, and this then makes us obliged to accept a more cautious, uh, cautious level of valuation, a lower discount rate, which, of course, leaves a, 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 a bigger deficit. So once again, these things are being moved around. And this is what I mean when I say that, you know, power relations are tied up in, in the calculative, calculative apparatus because we, the employees and the union, are, are relatively powerless. We're not, we don't have a seat at these particular negotiations. These are done behind closed doors um, between the, the trustees, the pensions regulator and so forth. Um, and we simply have to accept uh, what 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 is what is given to us? So this is the 2020 valuation. You can see you can see of course, and this is the story that we all know. It was conducted in March 2020. That's when the FTSE 100 in that graph there bottoms down to a level that you know it's subsequently recovered from. And and it, I mean you, you know it, it, monumentally and spectacularly unfortunate timing that that um, we've we've protested about. But actually, I don't think this is really the really the main the main story. I think this is only a partial story, not least because a big chunk of our assets is supposedly tied up in in, in infrastructure and gilts, which are not so sensitive to market movements. The crucial thing is the story that's told by the graph on the left. And that's where we can see very clearly in the light green, the obligations that are set in stone that are owed to our uh, present retired members and that are being valued at this very, very conservative gilt spot one percent. And therefore, it is the present members that have to soak up any of the additional costs and changes to the scheme. That's us in the darker colour. 
And at this point, the trustees held a gun to the head of the employers and they demanded contributions of 40 percent of salaries and additional covenantal support. And they said, and if you don't provide this additional cover covenantal support, we're going to demand an overall contribution rate of 56.2 percent. You know, it's just completely and utterly unaffordable. And the employers went at this point, went, well, OK, we can't afford we can't afford that. What 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 can we do? What can you do for 30, 30 percent? That's the best we can offer. Thirty points, thirty point seven percent or something or, 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 or thereabouts. And, and the trustees scratched their head and they said, well, you know, if you if you cut back the uh, accrual rate and move the move the, the 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 cap and all of these kind of things that we've talked about. And this then has resulted in the last round of very deleterious changes to our to our pension scheme. But there's something else going on here, and this is comes from Sam Marsh, who is one of our representatives on the uh, JNC and is a man who knows his numbers, and so I will trust his expertise. But um, he shows in this graph the um, the forecast of asset growth, the real asset growth in the USS portfolio is the hard line, the forecasts um, for as the various dotted line. Um, and his point being that every time the actual asset growth has beaten the assumptions, then USS has simply become more prudent to a point where the valuation document results in this kind of extreme prudence shown by the gray area where they are effectively assuming no growth in real term over th over 30 years. And Sam Marsh says, you know, I don't believe this kind of end of capitalism story. But importantly, I don't think USS do either, because when I read their documents, that's not what the numbers, uh, what the numbers tell us. And he's posted an explanatory video on YouTube that you can find to help you go through some of the nitty gritty if you're so interested, if you're interested. But he says this extreme prudence, much higher than USS has used in the past, is the overwhelming source of the low discount rates, which lead to the soaring costs and the eye-watering deficit estimates. The current position, and this comes straight from uh, USS's uh, uh, own data, but again courtesy of, of Sam Marsh, is that actually the technical provisions have uh, deficit has declined right down to a measly two and a bit billion from uh, from the 14 billion of, 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 of last year. So there's something going on and, you know, the question is what exactly and, and more importantly, where is all our money going? We're all making these big contributions. So there's another point of the valuation that we need to take into account, and that is their future service costs. Now here, as we continue to work, we will earn more benefits. These have to be accounted for. So the future service provisions are the level of contributions required over future years to cover the additional liabilities accrued in those years, plus additional contributions to eliminate the deficit over a 10 or 15 year period. And the reason it's a 10 and 15 year period and not longer as the uh, JEP had suggested is because the trustees have squeezed the employers as part of this a part of this deal to all agree to a moratorium on leaving the fund there's a clear prisoner's dilemma thing going on here because the the the, the fund is effectively or the covenant effectively is a last man standing guarantees the risk type affair then clearly the the last man standing is going to be in a lot of trouble so from a prisoner's dilemma you're all familiar with this kind of logic even though it would in fact be better for everyone to work together the next best option is to get out first and trinity Trinity College, Cambridge, one of the richest institutions in the scheme, uh, did a runner uh, uh, in in 2018. I think they paid out their obligations to the to the uh, to the scheme some 30 million pounds, and they and they stepped out. And this then caused us to go well. You know, the 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 regulator and the trustees to go well. Maybe the the the, the covenant isn't as strong as all of that. So they've locked the employers into the covenant over a 15 year period, at the end of which we have to have paid off the, the, the deficit. This is the recovery plan. This is a logic analogous to, to your bank saying, well, you know, you're going to stop working when you're 65. So you've got to pay off your mortgage by then. But anyway, um, the uh, this is all subject to the same discount rate. So this is another set 
of of self reinforcing um, uh, feedback loops because the cost of these high contributions is likely to deter new entrants and further and and, and and then you know further makes the fund look like a closed fund and if it's a closed fund it's not unreasonable for the uh, for the uh, regulators and the trustees to insist that it is self sustaining after a particular point the whole issue with USS is that it was never designed as, and it shouldn't be a, a, a closed fund. That's my view. So, you know, behind this is a, is a particular kind of political mood, mood music. I think, you know, since 2008, since the, the economics profession was called to account by Her Majesty, say, why didn't we see this coming? And they said, well, it's a black swan event. You know, it's beyond the, it's something of extremely low probability. It's beyond uh, the, the limits of our forecast and so forth. The watchword of, of regulators and, and, and so forth has been to look out for these kind of low possible these black swans these kind of low possibility but existential threats and so dame janet barker chair of the trustees writes we're seeking to protect the higher education sector and our members against solvency issues resulting from plausible market moves overestimating future returns by just 0.1 percent per annum would cause about 1.5 billion of additional unmanaged deficit to emerge in the future so you know, again, we come back to this financialized valuation, un, un, which is underpinning all of this, this particular kind of methodology of thinking about things. But it's very clear that the regulator would prefer a definite but suboptimal outcome for fund members to the remote possibility of, uh, of uh, a disaster being bankrupt universities and, and government bailouts. And that's very hard for us members who are currently in the scheme because we are stuck between retired members who have their, um, uh, their pensions guaranteed by law and whose obligations we are being forced to shoulder, constructed in a particularly aggressive manner by this um, GILTS plus 1% valuation. And um, we are seeing support from future entrants effectively being disbarred and actively deterred by, um, by the high costs of entry and low returns available from the, the fund, getting to a point where which no one in their right mind would choose to, to become a member. And that's what we're terribly, terribly keen to avoid. This is, I think, as Bourdieu might say, a kind of symbolic violence that's being in, enacted on colleagues. And there are also issues uh, about intergenerational fairness. Again, this is a mood mu music from David Willits, who says it would be wrong to expect students to bail out pension deficits to support pension schemes that are far more generous than students are likely to enjoy when they are older. There is a real kind of, you know, public hostility to to uh, to pension schemes. I remember Jeremy Clarkson, you know, uh, ever the barometer of public opinion uh, saying, you know, sitting on 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 the one show and saying, you know, how dare teachers or tube strikers or two tube train drivers or whatever it was how dare they strike you know a very terrible thing he said next which i won't i won't repeat but he said how dare they with their gold-plated pensions you know this is this is so unfair on everybody else who's who i don't know but it is just the way that things seem to be going now unfortunately the result of all of these uh, feedback loops is a uh, what we call a performative outcome um, uh, models um, using again there's a sort of backstory to these to these models in, in recent debates than the FT letter pages and so forth but I won't trouble you with that simply it's very clear that the long-term risk of default ie the fund running out of money or USS running out of money um, dramatically increases Increases as the proportion of the fund invested in equities falls. So de-risking counterintuitively increases the risk of a default right to uh, Davis and all. In other words, treating the fund as if it were a closed fund in terms of these kind of valuation methods seems very likely to cause it to become a closed fund um, and then moving the 
the the portfolio to this kind of less risky thing is likely to cause it to run out of money, which, of course, the prospect of it running out of money is likely to end in the shutting of the defined benefit aspects of the scheme altogether. Exactly what we we managed to repel um, in, in 2018. So that's a, that's a very depressing outcome. But as I say, it appears to be politically preferred that the members of the scheme, the present members of the scheme have, you know, a very suboptimal outcome personally to the the remote possibility of a or, or, of a more large scale um, catastrophe. And that is is absolutely part and parcel of what we talk about when we talk about financialization. It is the the uh, the opening, the, the the pushing of risk onto individuals. And then, of course, the opening up of those individuals as sites of potential profit because we all have to become savers and traders and investors and manage our own pension schemes and all of these kind of things. So some tentative conclusions. Um, financialized valuation methods construct risk in a particular way. The career of the financial fact, in this case the USS deficit, creates a space for political maneuvering. Networks of calculation reproduce power relations and the spectra of risk. And I call it a spectra of risk because it's a risk that is conjured purely through these mechanisms of of uh, of, of of calculation, uh, both ontologically and performatively. Um, it haunts these discussions and in a financialized move, it is laid off on individuals. So this valuation is not a neutral fact, but a highly politicized endeavor. And it's the fulcrum of a sustained effort to restructure pensions and reallocate risk. And we see this in the kind of communications that we get from USS. You know, how will you achieve your life sky lifestyle? goals we're we're savers we're kind of you know entrepreneurs all of these sort of things we're responsible for our own outcomes we're no longer dependent on um, on what we had previously regarded as uh, deferred deferred salary to serve deferred income and these as I hope I've shown are a reflection of broader questions about collective organization and responsibility of institutions and society more generally is there a way forward? Well, I, th I think there is. You know, I think, as I've shown, um, the USS is making use of what I'm kind of calling an epistemic arbitrage, the gap between the idea that a financial valuation is a real and fixed thing and the messiness of actually bringing it into being to enact a political agenda. And we need to work around uncovering and denaturalizing these valuation practices. And fortunately, because we are a community of academics, a lot of that work is being done and has been done. Um, and these are by no means uncontested. But I do think that the governance of the JNC is very problematic and it facilitates what what appears to me to be a divide and rule approach from the trustees um, who effectively are able to threaten the uh, threaten the employers who then eventually will side against us. I think what we need to see as a way out of this is is a, a strong leadership from the employers and also an understanding of, of, of what's at stake here and understanding of how these these issues are being are being worked out. The positive thing to say is that self-reinforcing feedback loops can also work the other way. And, and, and therefore, you know, commitment to an affordable, attractive and open ended scheme that affects, uh, attracts new members and new revenues, and new monies uh, is the best way of avoiding scheme failure altogether. But to get that is likely to require um, a, a complete rethink of the way that pension valuations um, are done. And that's why we require strong, strong leadership and understanding from our employers. That's all I have to say. Um, I hope you find this is useful and helpful and gives you something to, 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 to think about. And if you watched it all the way to the end, here are some references and thank you very much indeed for your time.